Okay, there we go. Um, so uh, where do we begin? Yeah, how, how about, um, I mean, one, one thing I'm wondering about is like, what does your day look like these days? Like, are you working on any writing projects? I know you've started this Substack recently. Does that kind of, I imagine that's, that's not what you're doing full time, obviously. <laughs> um, well, um, let's see. Uh, during the shutdown, I think I wrote most of seven books. It was a, an oddly frenetic period, two of them to get one of them, including Roland and Moonlight. And before that, a book that was 600 pages. Yeah, so it was um, obviously there was a great dis deal of nervous energy to be discharged. I have. Um, That's impressive. Uh, yeah, I'm still writing books at the moment. I'm finishing off a collection of short stories, and there's a big book on the philosophy of mind that I'm trying to make smaller. Uh, and um, I'm afraid that my life is fairly boring from the outside. I mean, I spend most of it writing. When I'm not writing, I'm walking or reading or sleeping. It's, it's pretty much, you know. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I eat. I mean, sometimes I watch a baseball game, you know. But it's it's really a, it's not it's not an exciting story, uh, otherwise. Uh, but my, but a great deal of writing. And not any no teaching at the moment, or no. I I uh, finished my association with the Institute of Advanced Study at Notre Dame not long before the COVID shutdown began. Mm, lucky. And I was well, yeah, no, well, not really, because I was I was in negotiations for what I was doing next, um, and uh, now I don't know if I if I'll go back to teaching or not. I prefer not to. It's not that I, I don't like teaching. Well, I don't. I mean, I don't like the time. I don't like the time it takes. I, I get I like the students. I get you know very attached to students, uh, and uh, you know over the years, I've built up many decades long friendships from students that I've had in the past. But the actual grind of teaching, uh, of academic teaching, is just the sheer amount of time it takes to accomplish very little. I think, I mean, there, you know, I, I think that, uh, and I'm one of those people who thinks that if he doesn't write down everything that he feels he has been fated to write down, then his life will be a failure. So yeah that sounds like um kierkegaard had kind of the same thing going on that might explain that might explain the the, the uh torrents of books you know <laughs> that, he produced that i the moment am producing <laughs> oh. so i mean how do you even manage to kind of um you know keep up with you know your scholarly field whatever that whatever that is um oh i, I do my without... best not, i do my best not to <laughs> In point of fact, actually, what I do is I try to be the cutting edge so that everyone else has to catch me. <laughs> okay, yeah, I guess and that makes I, it a I lot figure, easier. I mean, I, I figure right now the the job of Anglophone philosophical theology is is to write commentaries on my work. So, so <laughs> strangely enough, a lot uh, not not everyone agrees with that. But if I could convince myself that that's what should be the case, then I, I really don't have to keep up with anyone but myself. Although I'm finding that increasingly difficult to do, to be honest, because I'm, I seem to be producing books faster than I'm quite able to read them. So I, I hope they're they're good. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, certainly faster than I can read them. But I'm I'm really enjoying this this role in the Moonlight one. I mean, it's 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 just um, having a terrific uh, sort of um, impact on my imagination. Just kind of rekindling it and. Um, it's in helpful ways. Um, you, you seem to have put a lot of markers in the book. I have to say that's that's always a flattering sight for an <laughs> author. So you see, yeah, lots of multicolored slips of adhesive. Uh, <laughs> Probably at all the wrong places too. Um, but yeah, that that kind of leads me to one of the first questions I had. So, you um, you can correct me if, if this is if I'm mis mischaracterizing something, but you you characterized yourself in a recent interview as um, a rationalist, and maybe you were talking about your attitude towards um, you know organized religion or something, or maybe more broadly, 
but I, I was wondering, you know, well, it certainly doesn't fit the, uh, the, um, profile of the person who wrote that book so yeah that's what I was I was wondering I mean that that certainly doesn't um match you know what I'm reading in Roland and Moonlight where you have you know talking plants and um talking dogs and and this whole imaginative world and so I, I kind of was wondering what's sort of motivating um what, what's sort of driving your work in in Roland and Moonlight is like is it are you sort of following a a your intuitions or a sense of the numinous or your own experiences or like what's the sort of driving force um behind a work like that um i'm just trying to do justice to my sensei um my guru you know I, that's all i'm just recording his wisdom for posterity I, <laughs> no i look I'm, I'm not i'm not sure in what context i called myself a rationalist i i suspect there was there was a touch of irony in the description but there's also a certain truth in that in that um, I don't think that uh, reason rightly pursued is going to lead to where necessarily an 18th century philosoph will expect you to end up. But I do believe that that um, that uh, the sort of traditionalism that I'm assuming this was the context of the remark, the sort of traditionalism that I find myself at odds with. Uh, uh, offends against. Um, that is, you know, quite often I, I found when I was having debates about the book on universalism that I released a year and a half ago or so, um, we're making absolutely no progress because as soon as, as I, uh, my interlocutor came close to finding an argument I was making solvent or convincing or at least interesting, he would pivot away to a, from it to holy tradition or to what had been revealed. I never once had a good debate on that book. I didn't even get a good negative critique written of that book. Not, not one interesting assault on the book, which has never happened to me before because all of the attacks on it were attacks on the very idea, but not on the arguments I'd made. So of late, I might have been calling myself a rationalist, meaning that, that I insist that you cannot you, you, that faith does not consist in uh, you know, the blind embrace of anything that you imagine has been revealed by holy tradition if you can't even articulate your reasons for trusting tradition. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, but, but, but obviously, <laughs> Roland in Moonlight, I mean, that, that book is a confessional book in some ways. I mean, it's, it's the closest thing I've ever written to just a, a sort of manifesto. Mm. So uh, that I that the manifesto is delivered through uh, a talking dog and memories of a great uncle that I never had it might be a peculiarity of temperament, but uh, it seemed the right way to approach it. But uh, the person, I mean, that book is the closest, as I say, the closest thing I've come to just a self-portrait, however oblique. So, yeah, yeah. Um I've re I really enjoyed, um, I've really, really been enjoying it. I mean, um, I, what, what am I asking here? I mean, as I, as, as I kind of think of, um, of your work, I mean, the, the question sort of getting it is like, what's, um, do you think there, there's a sense of, um, the beautiful, like, I mean, your first, your first book was, was kind of about, um, beauty in some sense is, is that sort of, um, sense that, um, our vision of reality should not just be, you know, conforming to, um, you know, uh, the sort of brute facts or something, but, but it should be something beautiful and that our sense of beauty tells us something about reality. I mean, do you, do you think that, well, that yes. I, I wonder if that kind of intuition is something that that's, um, that's no, I, sort of I, key to your, to your work as a whole. Right. No, I certainly believe that's true. I, I don't believe that I've never, um, you know, there, there are a host of, of debates that one can have around the question of what a sense of the beautiful reveals or what it can conceal. You know, you can argue with, say, traditional Thomists as to whether or not beauty is a transcendental. They, basing it, basing their beliefs on, on Thomas's uh, taxonomy of the transcendentals, will often discount it. 
uh, although when Thomas talks about Pulcrum, he's not talking about beauty in the sense that, say, Plato or Plotinus or Gregory of Nyssa was when they spoke uh, of Tokelon. Um, uh, he means something that, uh, along the lines of arrestingly sparkly. You know, it's 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 actually his his uh, definition of the pulcrum is so incredibly banal that you realize that 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 what the Platonic tradition assigns to the beautiful, much of which he's putting under the rubric of the good, um, but. You know, or you can argue with um, your materialist friends, if you have any, uh, who, who are sure that, that a sense of the beautiful is either is somehow evolutionarily uh, advantageous, so they can never quite say how. The only book I know that ever undertook a real attempt to explain why the sense of beauty, which is, after all, a pervasive human phenomenon, should exist at all uh, was Dennis Dutton's *The Art Instinct*, and it's as and he was a he was a very bright and likable man, but it's a dismal failure of a book because it, it entirely fails. I mean, it comes down to being what appeals to us are representations of the sort of landscapes that that were evolutionarily beneficial to us. Mm. Uh, as an evolving species, well, that's clearly not the experience of the beautiful when I'm when I find myself, uh, you know, enraptured by Bach, or John Coltrane, for that instant, or instance, or or drawn uh, into a different frame of consciousness by the layerings of colors in a Chardin, it has nothing to do with the re what's represented, much less representation at all, or representation of a landscape that would appeal to my reptile brain. And I, I know because I listen to my reptile brain. He and I have long conversations and I know what he's thinking. <laughs> and that's not it. Um, it is the curious thing is, uh, you know, a sense of the beautiful is, is prodigally present in human experience. It seems to be evolutionarily nugatory because it can draw you its power of attraction takes you in any number of directions, some of which are quite contrary to the interests of survival uh, or common sense. You know, a person who, uh, you know, have you ever read Proust? No, should I? Okay. <laughs> yes, you should. <laughs> um, I'm rather disappointed you would ask, but okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is one, you know, one of the characters in the book who's half serious, half comical is Monsieur Begot, a writer who's mostly based on Anatole France. There, you know, he's not the only model, but mostly Anatole France. And the way Bergot dies is that he, uh, you know, he's already suffered a, a stroke uh, and there's an exhibition of Vermeer that he wants to go to and he's read an art critic who says in one of Vermeer's paintings, there's just a little patch of yellow on a wall that's so exquisitely rendered uh, as to be indescribable, uh, you know, just a patch of yellow and Bergot has to see this and he gets, you know, so he drags himself from his bed to say, of course, he, he does see it, it kills him. Um, but this is a common enough experience. I mean, the, the desire for the beautiful is so exorbitant in us and it's so contrary to our, our uh, even you would think our most prudential interests that it clearly constitutes a kind of transcendental horizon that, that, that is very difficult to reduce to material causes or material interests or evolutionary imperatives. Moreover, among the things we think of as transcendentals, if we, if we're, if we want to think in that way, and we should be, because every act of will, every act of cognition in which we engage, if you reduce it to its teleology, and there's always a teleology and an intentionality, you'll find that the, the, that the ultimate end towards which it's aimed is a transcendental one. The beautiful cannot be convincingly dissembled as something more pragmatic. The good can be the true, 
being, you know, <laughs> unity. The beautiful, though, is in a sense the most is, is sort of the most pure apprehension of the transcendental horizon. It's the, it's it's the most disinterested, and the most contrary to the materialist narrative. So yes, I think that that uh, I've always, I mean, from the first book I wrote, obviously through Roland and Moonlight, made that a paramount concern. It doesn't mean that the aesthetic trumps the ethical or the veridical or anything else, but it does mean that it's it's a, it's an especially privileged vantage uh, uh, upon the transcendental ends of human nature and upon their spiritual capacities. Yeah, and I mean, uh, just the contrast how how beautiful your work is in contrast to to you know uh, the sort of popular materialism is is, is sort of another. Uh, kind say of that just thing. as I spill coffee in my beard. Yeah. <laughs> the beautiful good thing about well. like a beard like this is it's a record of the day's mishaps. You know. <laughs> People will be mistaking you for one of those hip Calvinist pastors or something. Well, well, you know, it's during the shutdown, I decided not to trim my beard. My wife actually doesn't like me trimming my beard. She actually likes it long. There, there, there are yes, there are women who like long beards. I, I was going to ask you. I mean, what what is your what does your wife think of your beard? But I figure that might be inappropriate. I think she feels the more that I'm hidden behind something, <laughs> the better the the better at the face I show the world. Um, no, she uh, she just uh, insisted that I stop trimming my beard, and I I did, and now it's you know I can see when winter comes I can I can curl into it uh, like a cat. You know. <laughs> There's something sublime and um, um, wild about a large beard. I don't know. Well, my eldest brother has one that, if left to itself, becomes a whole forest. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, all three, uh, the three Hart brothers, we all have beards, but but my eldest brother Addison has one that could conquer vast territories <laughs> if left to <laughs> devices. You know. Just go out there, take over Central Europe, you know, so. Um, you know, I, I was thinking um, of this Dostoevsky phrase, um, if he has truth in one side and Christ in the other, he would choose Christ. Do you know what he means? And, and do you think that's sort of descriptive of your work? Um, uh, nope, uh, it's not descriptive of my work because I, I would choose truth if I thought that Truth and Christ, or on uh, I would I would assume that the truth is always true. And if Christ, if I came to the conclusion that Christ were not the truth, then I would. Uh, well, what do you think he means then? Um, I think I think it was just one of those uh, uh, <laughs> buoyant uh, hyperboles to which he was given that that are one of the great defects of his his work. That's why Tolstoy is an immeasurably greater artist, and Tolstoyevsky at his most profound is also often a little bit adolescent. Mm. Uh, but I, I hate I hate that kind of fideism. To me, it makes a mockery of what real faith is and what, um, you know. Uh, now, of course, in the context, you can say that what he meant was if all of rational truth, all of philosophical truth, all of scientific truth were on one side and Christ on the other. Yeah, I, I, you I, to I choose see. between them. Uh, you know, which draws him more, and he says Christ draws him more. But, you know, I, it's just to me. I would have assumed he, he's assuming a kind of tarnished materialistic vision oh, of yeah, truth no, there. Yeah, but, but I just think that it's a lousy way of expressing it. Yeah. Uh, if he was to say that if the, if the consensus of all wise and rational uh, and, and, and profitable reason were on one side and the lonely derelict figure of Christ offering me only the testimony of his wounds and the ferocious love of the poor that he expressed in his life. If I had to choose between those two, okay, then I understand what he's talking about. But I, but that's not how I put it. And so I've never enjoyed, I've never quite, you know, I, I, I kind of know what he's getting at and I kind of don't like the, the, the extreme because Let's be honest, there's a great deal in, in Dostoevsky uh, that can go in fairly sinister directions and does. I mean, mm. his anti-Semitism especially. And, um, you know, uh, when, you're, when you're confronted with that, 
uh, you see how his nationalism drove him to anti-Semitism and, and a picture of Christianity that was as anti-Semitic as the worst of Russian orthodoxy has been at times. And then you see him mocking Turgenev for Turgenev's more open and cosmopolitan and liberal beliefs, although the latter are much closer to a true Christian understanding of what, how you should view others. Uh, I think it's a great danger to be intoxicated by, uh, by Dostoevsky's reputation as a prophet or a mystic or whatever. I think in many ways he was a blithering idiot. But when he was profound, he was very profound. You know, you take the good with the bad. What's your favorite bad... moment of his? In Dostoevsky? Yeah. Um, well, I, I see the problem is I'm fine. I, as I've got, gotten older, I've, I've come to like him less and less. Mm. Uh, I, I don't know why that is. So it's the earlier, I like the double. The double. I like the end of the, his most Kafka-esque, so to speak, story. The one that I think... You know, there, there's a there's a strange surreal genius that you find in a lot of Middle European and Eastern European uh, writers. Uh, Kafka is a great example, but also Bruno Schultz, uh, Vitold Gombrowicz. You know, you, you the, the, uh, there's, there's a long and um, honorable tradition of the of the ghastly and surreal, uh, and Gogol obviously is a perfect example of this. And the early Dostoevsky, I like the double, is a good example of that. So I would say that, that that's my favorite now. I, uh, the big novels I find harder and harder. Uh, I don't know why. I just I find the melodrama too thick. I mean, I and I find the sort of Christianity they preach more and more dubious. Hmm. Um. Well, here's an, uh, another another angle. I mean, um. So this this kind of connects to the earlier question, but I, I wonder, um, you know, you, connecting your thoughts on you know on and faith and, and rationality as sort of um, being inextricably intertwined. I wonder yeah. what you would make of uh, the work of someone like Harawas or or Barth, and the way they kind of um, sort of uh, see Christianity as this sort of. Um, self-enclosed linguistic system, which um, maybe that's an obvious well, so, well, sometimes, I mean, you know, you realize that Stanley is not the most consistent in this regard, Stanley Hauerwas. I mean, he, he has that uh, Yale School Wittgensteinian side to him. Mm -hmm. He's also, though, has this very uh, uh, practical sense of, of the Christian life as a vocation to and in the world of radical peacefulness and, uh, you know, in which, uh, you know, arguably, uh, it becomes a challenge to the world's self-understanding, not simply as something contrary and self-enclosed, but as something that's intelligible from the outside. And some of his formulations go both ways. But I'm not, I mean, I'm not in that tradition. I'm not a great admirer of Bart. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that Bart was, um, you know, brilliant and beguiling as someone expressing one dialectical extreme that, that's the adverse of another dialectical extreme, both of which I think should be rejected. Um, at the end of the day, but there's a lot I love in Bart. I mean, you know, the part four of the church dogmatics, especially the uh, the first two divisions, the uh, the way of the Son of God into the far country and the homecoming of the Son of Man. I think that's a that's a brilliant uh, Christology in actu, one that captures the way in which the whole course of the life of Jesus of Nazareth is also uh the eternal venturing forth of god towards his creatures these are not it's not a before and an after it's not a kind of mm -hmm. descent and return narrative it's a simultaneous event in which god is forever always the god man and there's always you know what, what he would later call the humanity of god i like that quite a lot but i think that the deficiencies in bart are are, are considerable as well I, I don't put him on a level with the greatest uh, Orthodox or Catholic 
theologians of the 20th century who also understood the importance of the metaphysical and who weren't given to the to the to the false uh, temptations of paradox who understood that 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 there are that in order to assert the unique uniqueness of Christ you don't have to deny the ontological ground of of the you know of Christology so you know so um, to me Bart's a very mixed character he's not he's not like Shivara or, or and he's certainly not on the level of Bulgakov. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if, if I'm enough of a Bart, Bart expert to make this statement, but I, it, it often seems to me that Bart kind of ends up um, sort of reinventing the wheel from his own unique vantage point where he'll kind of end up, you know, sort of with his, his sort of doctrine of election. It seems like he does sort of end up in a very similar position. That's the pro that's, that's true. Or breaking up my end or yours i'm sorry i couldn't hear you you broke up um how about now yes that's better no, okay so I, think I, I can hear you yeah i was just saying um the the way bart seems to sort of reinvent the wheel uh, and then what do you make of that do you think that's accurate or Or am I breaking up again? Sorry about that. Um, I, I think that, yeah, you are. Oh, um, <laughs> uh, gee, I wonder, if, is this on my end or on yours? Be on my end. I don't know what would cause this. Yeah, it seems to be okay again. We could try, just keep trying. I guess. Well, I think I got the point of what you were saying. And I think that uh, it's a temptation in all Protestant and reformed dogmatics always to start over again. Because, uh, you know, they don't believe, you know, it's not, these are traditions that are anti-traditional traditions in a sense. I mean, they, 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 their mythology, and it is obviously a mythology, is that they aren't uh, that the, the that the authority of of the uh, claims they make are not based in the tradition, but but are there at the beginning in some way that requires only the proper sort of uh, exegesis to unfold them. But since you're not taking this on the authority of tradition or of institution. Offices, you have to begin always again. You're always retreating to first principles, reestablishing first principles, and then trying to uh, enucleate your conclusions from there. What is it? Hello? Yeah, it, it just broke off again, but I, I think I, I got that. Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, where do we want to go from here? Um, yeah, uh, I mean, obviously you're, you're kind of, gee. See if we. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, hmm. I mean, um, so let me just throw in one more question. I mean, so when you're talking about the, the relationship between reason and faith, um, how, how would you think about, I think, I think you, you formulated it in a different way than, than I've heard you say it before, where it's, um, you're saying that, that faith shouldn't, um, you know, just sort of force people to accept crap that doesn't make any sense. But I, I, I guess, you know, so much of, of Christianity, sort of the, the sort of logic of the cross in a sense, that's a, a kind of, you know, offense to reason in some sense. So, so how would you think of, of that kind of, um, you know, strange, um, uh, paradoxical element to it? How, how is that? How does that? Um, how, how does in, in that sense, it seems like um, revelation has a priority to faith that that makes 
or reason um, think something that it couldn't think on its own or something. Um, sorry, did you get that? It just broke out again. I, yeah, I don't think that's true. I mean, I think it can it can make <laughs> it, can, it can make reason recognize too hidden, uh, but not that it would be incongruous with the exercise of reason, right? I mean, uh, I don't see that, you know, the, 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 the business about the paradox of the cross, which isn't really paradox, Maybe that's is that it, 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 uh, it, it comes as a shock to a certain world. Yeah, it comes to a, a, as a shock to a certain world order a certain understanding of the hierarchy of divine privilege and how this is mediated in ranks of human privilege and how a certain kind of wisdom uh, has always subserved that, that order of powers. That's what Paul's talking about. And, and in that sense, yeah, philosophy is humbled. At the same time, though, when it comes to situating his gospel in, in the language of those he's talking to, he, he has no problem, uh, you know, apparently, especially if Acts is not accurate at all, of drawing on the metaphysical. And 1 Corinthians 15 is a good example where he's using a fairly technical uh, Greco-Roman uh, semi-Platonist, Hellenistic Jewish uh, so he's not talking about some kind of opposition uh, between reason as such and revelation as some sort of brute fact that drops from the heavens, but mm -hmm. that, yeah, that, that the assumptions that we've made about those among whom God dwells, those among whom he reveals himself, where the principal emphasis of his bounty lies, the ways related to the nations, that obviously is 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 all revised and and fundamentally altered by by the events of the crucifixion by the cross. But but I don't think we should confuse these two things. You can turn that into some sort of rhapsodic language of paradox that can, then becomes an excuse for insisting on believing even what you shouldn't believe. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, um, you, maybe you could talk about the, the, the kind of the logic of the cross or the, the rationality of the cross as a sort of um, new mode of rationality that is unleashed upon. Um, the, I mean, what, what do you make of, of this kind of language of um, you know, you see this in, in kind of apocalyptic New Testament scholarship of, of sort of um, Christ breaking in or um, this sort of language of sort of a um, disruption of, of the, the established. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, does that make? Okay, well, yeah. Now, breaking in on what, though? Yeah, maybe that's the question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Apocalypse. I mean, I've used the language myself. Um, that um, the apocalyptic language is especially powerful over against the pretensions of human power, mm -hmm. right? Um, in the in the world uh, of the first century, uh, in Greco-Roman culture and under Roman rule. There's no division between uh, the sacred and the profane in terms of uh, of orders of power. I mean, they're, 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 they're divisions of rank, but there's no ontological division. And there's, no, and there's certainly no division between the supernatural and the natural that's, that's um, uh, of the sort that, that later theology in the West will try to embrace, or between religion and society or politics, right? These are all, this is all a continuum. Um, 
when when Christ stands before Pilate, he's standing before somebody who represents not just the power of the empire, but the sacred power of, of, of the Supreme Pontiff and of the whole sacred order of, of class rule, imperial rule, but also of the rule of the daimoni, the, 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 uh, the intervallic deities who are emissaries between this world and God, all the way up uh, to the highest divine principle. And so uh, it's against the entire political and religious world of power, privilege, and, and class distinction uh, and everything else uh, that the, the figure of Christ breaks into human consciousness as a, after all, the form of a slave being raised up as the supreme eschatological revelation of the love of God for his creatures. That would be fundamentally different from saying that, that the whole idea of incarnation and salvation is somehow contrary to all rational categories and has to be embraced simply as a paradox, because that's not true. It actually, in order to understand what happened in, in Christ, also requires an understanding of the possibility of the union of the divine and the human. You know, the, the, this is not a, a meaningless statement that it is possible to, to speak in terms of uh, the divine and the human that, that makes a rational case for the reality of the miraculous exchange of natures and all that. If you separate those two issues, which is what I, which is all I, I would insist we need to do here, understanding that there is sort of the rationality that the world presumes based on power. Mm -hmm. And this is the way things are, so it's the way things ought to be. That the divine is mediated to us as much through the orders of social preeminence and social abasement, political power, the power to kill, as it is uh, through, through the which they reflect the supernatural. That expectation is frustrated and disrupted and overthrown. But the metaphysical language of, of, of uh, you know, the logos or, or, or the secondary principle of God in which all the, of all rational principles of creation or contained that taken in the gospel of John using uh, and, and, and not in, a, in an ironic way or a metaphorical way, but stating outright that there is some one-to-one -one correspondence, some identity between this man and the, the metaphysical foundation of reality and all the principles that, uh, uh, upon which it's built. At that point, the cross, you know, God, I don't want to sound Hegelian about it, so I'm not saying God dying into humanity, but, 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 but God penetrating to the very depths of the estrangement of creation from God and humanity being lifted up into, into direct union with God is not contrary to the expectations of the nations. It's far in excess of those expectations, but it certainly uh, fulfills implicit principles, both metaphysical and religious, that are there throughout human experience. If it didn't, it would be unintelligible. You know, the notion that the event of the gospel creates its own sphere of, of intelligibility, you know, the, sort of the early parts of the first version of the river brief is just gibberish when you try to think, you know, it's, that's, it's just not, first of all, it's not possible. It's also manifestly what did not happen. <laughs> uh, you know, if that's true, then, then you'd have to say that you'd have no basis even for the language of the New Testament, so much of which is inflected through the Greco-Roman, through the Hellenistic metaphysics and, and rationality of its time. Um, goodness, that's, that's, really, that's, that's brilliant. Um, uh, I have one question. Um, so, I mean, what does it mean then? I think this would take us to, here's a different question. I mean, um, 
a, a sort of common trope in in sort of internet natural law discourse or or whatever is this sort of <laughs> is this one of the, is this one of the things that really exists that that's a thing is it okay uh, yes i'm afraid so but um the the sort of um way natural law gets talked about um i suppose more more popularly today is a sort of um it's equated with a kind of darwinian natural selection survival of the fittest logic um so that Ooh you know, it's sort of natural law is the power, you know, the powerful rise to the top of the week. And, and um, well, that's not even good Darwinism, but anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, Dar Darwin didn't claim that the powerful rise, to, you know, there is some of that going on. There's certain species that are, that are more, uh, could, better able to survive due to their superior strength and rapacity, but there are others that enjoy huge evolutionary benefits because of uh, the power of cooperation or their uh, their durable their durable um, contemptible yeah <laughs> you know, like cockroaches you know uh, through, through so simply through through numbers and through uh, having a very very durable bow uh, 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 you know uh, body structure bow form but uh, yeah but anyway I, go on yes all right so this is so, well, natural law has become nature red in tooth and claw and yeah and, and and it's not just that it's also um it'll be used to sort of um you know paul talks about neither slave nor free uh greek nor jew male nor female so he i mean from my vantage point what the gospel sort of does is it it sort of subverts um you know our natural um familial relationships. It naturally, it, it subverts our hierarchies of um, power. It subverts our, um, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, master-slave relationships. The, all of these kind of um, sociological, biological realities are, are kind of subverted into this, uh, by this new order. Right. Um, and, and it just seems like um, the way natural law often is used is, is essentially as a defense of the status quo to say, well, and, and, and I mean, that's how it's been used um, often throughout history. So I wonder, how would you think about a better way of talking about natural law and how, how something like natural law could fit into a, a Christian I, conception I, of things? I, I just have no use for the language of natural law, but, but mm. even, but certainly I, I prefer the traditional Catholic understanding to a larger degree, to a Darwinian to a strange Darwin. I mean, because of course, the, the notion of natural law was not simply that you imitate uh, 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 nature. It's, uh, there are such things as natures, which have in them intrinsic ends that can be known uh, even by. Uh, Uh, the illuminated reason uh, that these ends are obviously true, that they, they define for us uh, our obligations to one another if, if, if we would that they flourish rather than that, that uh, we simply make them happy, uh, but that, they, that, they, that we make them happy in the fullest sense. So that, uh, you know, natural law dictates that if you're hungry, uh, I feed you uh, in part because feeding is what 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 cures hunger, but also because there's there's a, a communal bond between us, which is part of our nature that mustn't be thwarted without that redounding to 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 the suffering of both of us. Okay. And that, so in that sense, natural law, it, it doesn't mean, I mean, it never meant in the past simply obeying the exa exemplars of the natural world, especially since Christians believe the natural world was in bondage to death, just like us, but rather that, that uh, ethics or the moral good has to be based upon the concrete natures we possess as rational creatures oriented towards the good in a particular way. What I dislike about natural law theory is the abuse of it in part that you, you allude to uh, obliquely, which is that quite often it's been used 
to uh, argue for things as warranted by natural law that clearly are simply the preferences of certain traditions, certain cultural dispositions rather than others, and that we put too great a weight on it and try to make arguments from natural law that simply aren't there to be made. You know, that, that that's my uh, problem with the tradition and those who have appointed themselves spokesmen for natural law often turn out to have the most horrendously evil notions of what it should entail. Uh, a lot of my, uh, I won't say friends, acquaintances in the manualist, traditionalist, Thomist uh, um, school. I must, well, I must ask, when, whenever you refer to, to the Thomists, are you referring specifically to Edward Fieser or? Well, Edward, well, Fazer's, he's actually, um, he wouldn't, be, I, he said, I don't know, he doesn't write theology. Uh, I don't, I mean, politically, he and I couldn't be farther apart. And I think he uh, uh, doesn't know enough about the rest of Christian tradition. He often thinks he's speaking for Christianity when he's speaking only for a certain Thomas tradition. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he would be a good example of a person who oh, talks right. about natural law, but then writes a big book in defense of capital punishment, as if that's something a Christian can do. And plenty of so-called Christians in history have shared his views, but there is no, no way in God's green earth that you can look at the example of the teachings of Christ in the early church and not know that this was an abhorrence to Christian conscience. It simply was. And instead, he, you know, he writes a book in which he has some, some lousy anthology of, of bits of the Father's badly translated, ripped out of context, is used to justify then a series of incredibly bad arguments for a principle that is the antithesis of the Christian view of, of the good. And, he and thinks, Roland um, venomously agrees, as we heard in the background. So, <laughs> Roland, you know, the funny thing is that's that's you, you, you. In fact, heard Roland barking, but that's not what's extraordinary about him. He really does talk, uh, not perhaps quite as articulately as the book would lead you to believe. But he's a mimic. I don't. Know, he's a mutt. Uh, he's a you know. I, it might be the blue tick hound in him, which I've heard are mimics. But he has long phrases. What can he say? How, well, he can say, how are you, very mm. clearly, whenever he greets you, come along. Uh, and then they're like long syntactical uh, cadenzas that I, you know, I can't follow. But, yeah, no, I mean, there are recognizable phrases. How are you? Uh, sometimes the Y becomes a W. It's hard with a mouth that's shaped like that. <laughs> and I think that's how he turned into a talkie. So you hear him barking, but what you haven't heard you haven't heard him giving a discourse, the disquisition, as he does every morning when he wakes me up. The first thing he says is, how are you? And then... <laughs> what a delightful dog. He's the strangest damn dog I've ever had. I, I love him. I mean, God, you know, it's obvious I love him. I love I love animals in general, but but he is one eccentric and strange dog I've, I've, I've had many pets over the years. I've loved them all. They're all, uh, each one is, uh, each one has his or her own character, but he's one of the animal kingdom I've, I've ever encountered. And the thing is, I don't even understand why, for instance, he's not like a collie. I can't train him to do things easily if I, well, I couldn't he's 11 now anyway and yet he can talk you know so it's, <laughs> yeah, it's very hard to judge iq here so anyway um you yeah, well, there's another thing i have against the thomas of course is this uh, this uh, they actually buy into thomas aquinas's horrible eschatology which is so totally unbiblical <laughs> so yeah totally contrary to the actual teachings of the early church and in fact the, the doctrinal language used in most of Christian history, but it doesn't matter. The rule I've always found with Thomas is that, uh, you know, the truth is quod Thomas Dixit. Uh, but yeah, all right, so back to natural law. That's the problem is, is that in principle, uh, yeah, our, uh, our, our, our morality in part should be an attempt 
uh, to understand the nate it's you know the, the sort of the kantian categorical imperative is a, a rather deficient and defective understanding of of moral obligation especially if it isn't filled in with with a really deep understanding of the natures of those to whom you would do the good but that has too often in the history of not only Christian, but any, any tradition, I'm sorry about that, any tradition that invokes natural, uh, a pretension to know more about what's good for people than you actually know, and the right to use coercion to that end. Uh, and, the, the, you know, it's just the natural law tradition is espoused by persons whom I wouldn't trust to know to be morally intelligent enough to tie another person's shoe, shoelaces, <laughs> let alone determine how they ought to live. So uh, do you, um, what, what kind of language do you prefer instead of natural law? Do you, do you kind of accept the basic premise under a different language or, or what do you kind of want to reframe the whole discussion? I accept the premise that you should understand the human, that you should understand in your obligations to others you should try to understand what what fulfills their natures as the creatures they are. That's true. I just don't think that that's an understanding nearly as easily gained as people imagine. And so even that desire has to be under a rule of restraint, which refuses coercion because coercion already, uh, it, it, because in so you've made that the rule, nature becomes an attempt to determine how you will engineer the lives of others according to according to your understanding. Uh, the radical, you know, I, I think, you know, Christ is quite clear on this. I mean, you know, the, the, the emphasis is on justice and love about not using violence, about, you know, not being corrupt. Uh, and, you know, once that's in place, thereafter, you may talk about the goods that we share as human beings and what we owe to one another. But there is this radical language of love and compassion that, you know, so, well, it's true in Buddhism as well. I mean, you know, uh, metta, loving kindness, karuna, compassion has to be the premise from which you work before you then attempt to teach the dharma to others because otherwise you're going to think that you have a license I mean, this is christian history right the, the doctrine of natural law the doctrine of eternal punishment for those who fall afoul of it becomes a license for obscene violence a cloak for spoliation and imperialism you know, uh, it, it, it's it's a it's a language that has done arguably just as much harm, in fact, more harm than good, in the history of Christian thought. So the apocalyptic ethics of Christ, the just just absolutely unworldly kind of lilies of, of the field, impracticality of of serving the poor. refusing violence, refusing the sword, that has to be the ground and basis. Everything else comes after. Um, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's wonderful. Um, I don't know if the, you, that, that, you see the problem is, I don't know if that yields a practical code of law. I don't know if Christianity is a, is a philosophy of governance. Mm -hmm. I tend to think it's a kind of anarcho-communist daydream half the time. It's just that some sort of faith in me says it would actually be possible that you really could live in a community based on love and knowledge of this sort, uh, even though it's never made itself, ne never made much of an appearance in human history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I don't know if, if you'd agree with this, but um, I, I've... I've recently um, been, been really, really so I was reading um, Charles Taylor's The Secular Age, and he draws a lot on the work of Ivan Illich and, and the, the sort of Good Samaritan 
um, parable, his reading of it. And I, I wonder if, if the Christian community isn't supposed to be a kind of what he calls networks of agape, the sort of that, that it sort of springs from that um, sort of direct personal encounter um, rather than through uh, something institutional. Um, but um, at the same time, I mean, um, you know, you mentioned that, that, that it's a sort of anarcho-communist thing. I mean, in a strange way, like my own, uh, you know, how to write tradition, like <laughs> in its own uh, messed up way, that's what it was sort of founded to attempt to establish and um, not entirely successful, but um, there are yeah. elements of it that, yeah. that sort of uh, do still point back to that <laughs> radical core, I guess. Sorry, you're cutting off. Um, can you hear me? You're looking at there. Your face isn't moving, but you know. Gee, that is off. Um, yeah, I missed that whole section. Um, just as I was, yeah. Could you repeat that? Or I think you're back on, back on now. Sorry about this internet connection. I don't know why it's acting this way. You, these things are unpredictable. No matter no matter uh, how good the technology at both ends is, what it's a, part of it's just traffic. Um, you know, the Hutterite tradition is very admirable in this regard. Um, it, uh, it, whatever disagreements I would have with it would have to do with, uh, uh, you know, metaphysics and, and, and other understand, you know, but, <laughs> but, uh, but those are matters of theory. Uh, in terms of practice, there's a great, you know, it's, it's obviously a very very, very admirable and a, and a sincere attempt to live a Christ-like life contrary to the powers and principalities. Yeah, um, I don't know how successful it is for sure, but um, yeah, um, I was, yeah, I mean, I, I well, was... No, no, no Christian tradition. A success. <laughs> all, they've all been miserable failures in, in one respect or another. So, um, yeah, fair enough. Really, I mean, if you were if you were basing your faith basically on the on the record, basing your faith on what? Just on the uh, record of achievement, and by achievement you meant achieving. Uh, the Christian good that, that it professes, not achieving power or cultural preeminence or whatever, you, 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 would, uh, you would find very little to encourage you in Christian history. You know, uh, there's some good things there, some improvements, some ameliorations of imperial society after the fourth century, but on the whole, uh, but this isn't, you know, you know, obviously isn't the gospel, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose <laughs> one kind of apologetic would be that um, th th that that there, that there remains something transcendent about the, the Sermon on the Mount if you sort of look at the abysmal record of history. Like the fact that <laughs> nobody has been able to achieve this maybe sort of makes you think that there must be something transcendent about it. Uh, well, I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually, what always impresses me when I go back to the Sermon on the Mount, especially in the Greek, and uh, and the, uh, the teachings of Jesus in general in the synoptics, is the degree to which they consist in very mundane and practical advice, some of which is lost in translation, you know, it's... Uh, but when he's telling, you know, at the time he preached, 
it's a we we take for that a great deal of his concern was the relief of the suffering of the poor. There was a debt crisis in Judea and Galilee, you know, and the courts that he talks about people being dragged into, there were not criminal law courts. I mean, criminal law was just basically, uh, you know, uh, a, a very simple matter. You're found guilty, you're killed. You know, it was not, uh, it wasn't an elaborate system. Most of the court systems had to do with uh, debt. And um, we, Christ talking about, you know, when you're being dragged to court, try to, try to, uh, reach a, an agreement before you go into the court with the, with with the plaintiff otherwise he'll despoil you of everything and you'll, you'll get thrown in the debtor's prison and you'll be you, you know you'll be uh, tortured or you'll be in prison till your death i mean it's very very practical advice and even a lot of what we don't think of as practical advice is practical advice like you know we resist not evil well that's not what it says it says don't you know? Basically, the evil one, the evil man, the rogue. Don't uh, don't try to fight him with force. You're going to lose. He's got everything on his side. Or um, yet, let your yes be yes, your no be no. Anything more? The way I translate is anything more extravagant from this comes from a, from a rogue. And what he's telling him is, don't let yourself uh, don't let yourself be cheated. Don't let yourself be beguiled by these charlatans who swear. Make, make lavish oaths and promises uh, rather than actual simple concrete agreements, yes and no. Or in the Sermon on the, uh, the uh, even the, the Lord's Prayer, you know, give us this day our daily bread. Uh, you know, give us today enough food, epiosian enough, sufficient for the day, uh, you know, for, for Pardon our debts, not forgive us our trans trespasses, as we remit the debts of those who owe us money. Don't drag us into court, not don't lead us to temptation, but uh, just, you know, and rescue us from this evil man, this wicked man, the rogue, the guy who wants to uh, use his status as, as a creditor to steal everything we have and reduce us to poverty, reduce us to slavery. Um, and a lot of that gets etherealized and spiritualized, of course, in Christian tradition. And to, I think, an unfortunate degree. I mean, the Lord's Prayer is such a, in the Greek, is such a practical prayer that the poor pray for relief from debt and from hunger and, and from being, uh, being robbed in the law courts. Um, that we can forget that the basis of the, the, the Christian ethos that Christ thought was, was actually a uh, social and economic justice. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we can talk about natural law uh, till the cows come home and whether or not, you know, uh, married couples can use certain kinds of, of um, uh, birth control and not others and, you know, natural birth, you know, Again, though, the, 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 uh, the claim to know through some almost sort of oracular grasp of what is naturally natural for the human can already lead you down paths of making authoritative pronouncements that you shouldn't be making. But you shouldn't, you, you can't even get to that point in, in moral reasoning at all if you haven't first grounded the Christian ethos in in the sort of unremitting absolute concern for, uh, for a certain sort of social justice for the poor uh, a certain sort of reordering for a society which condemns great wealth and which refuses the use of violence and you know coercion, and thereafter, well, I guess we're back to the natural law issue here. Only thereafter can we start talking. Uh, you know, but if you're going to say, you know, there's this movement abroad right now, especially in America, because in America everything is done uh, to extremes. 
until something has been made ridiculous, it hasn't been seriously tried. That's the way we think. Uh, there's this great, you know, this, this sudden revival of, of a sort of phalangist fascism in, in right-wing Catholicism in America calls itself integralism, although it's anything but integral. It's actually an early modern sort of notion. And they don't state. even like the Pope. How is that going to work? Yeah, no, well, but I mean, <laughs> the funny thing about it is, first of all, it's not, it's not an integral view of society. It's a strictly authoritarian view of society that, that you know, people like Adrian Fermuel or however you pronounce his name, it clearly has no notion of what Christian tradition and Christian society really was. Uh, but, um, it, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not, an, it's not, it has nothing to do with an integration. It's purely a sort of vertical uh, enforcement of a certain very strict understanding. And of course, with all the, the predictable pathologies, you know, the the exclusion of non-baptized Catholics from rule, this sort of childish uh, delight in the notion of a world empire, the, the obvious misogyny, which is because a great many of the people to whom integralism appeals are sort of these slightly reptilian incels who despise women for, for not, uh, and, and so they like to fantasize about uh, submissive wives uh, whom they can order around and punish and, and, and deny, you know, because because they're you know, pallid little uh, uh, atrophied souls living in their in basements and trying, praying to God fervently each night to deliver them once more from the abominations of Onan. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, it, it, is, it is a psychosexual, sadomasochistic, sort of uh, fantasy game for people of, 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 of arrested emotional, spiritual, and sexual development. But in America, it's actually got serious followers who think that this is Christianity because, hey, uh, you know, it's patriarchalist and, uh, and Jews don't get to vote. <laughs> you know, it, you know this. This the people. This is Christianity, and and if you were at, you ask them, the basis of many of their because of course they're also many of them are sort of two tier Thomists who, you know, are going to argue that that all of this is evident already in natural law. You know that that uh, you know the natural law dictates that 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 a woman should only be allowed to work outside the house. With her husband's permission, you know, and of course they they uh, they reify they they uh, they idolize the family as all fascists do. Every fascist movement, phalangist movement, always is good for the family. Curiously, it's like Jesus, enough, right? Yeah, well, that's the funny thing. The family isn't <laughs> actually a value in the early church. It's actually Jesus and Paul don't seem to be you know that big on the family as as a locus of moral concern. Uh, if anything, they see it as just another structure of property and power and uh, something of dubious, uh, dubious virtue. I mean, Christ, who is my mother and my, my brother and my sister to those who do the will of the Father? Paul doesn't even want you to get married, for God's sake, and if you have to, because you, you know, because you can't contain yourself, uh, then, uh, you know, there's just you know, realize that, that but, but ideally, you know, you, you want to devote yourself to the kingdom. And really in Christ, there's no male, man and woman, male and female, actually is what it says, not male, man or woman or male or female, which might mean that, that marriage status, just like national status, because it's, you know, there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, nor is there, is, is there male and female. So he might be saying that in Christ, there's not social status, there's not national distinction, and the family, you know, the married state, man and woman together, is not of consequence either. That's not where your primary loyalty lies. It's not the sort of um, family unit that just sort of cares for itself and its offspring. It's a much wider um, right. Well, and let's concern. Or well, let's remember what what 
what family is, not only in the ancient world, but in much of the modern world. I mean, we all love our families. It's not that. It's not that you shouldn't love. I mean, he's very good about it. Christ talks about loving your children and being a good father and all that. that that's not. But the family as a, as a structure of, of the preservation of wealth and of a loyalty that is, to which other loyalties, such as the, your, your, your duty to the poor or to God, is, is strictly subordinated, is not a good thing. It's, family is not a primary. A family is justified as a structure of life in terms of the natural affinity of children and parents and love. Uh, you think the embrace of, of, a, of, of a religious devotion to justice, but the family itself, clearly, as you no doubt know, because I saw you wincing when the family was brought up, is itself not the center of sentimental or moral concern in the New Testament. It's, yeah. strictly yeah. second. it's, it's like the state or any other institute or, or, or the religious institutions. It's an institution that exists for the preservation of private interests over the, over the demands of, of charity. But what's interesting about the family is that the family is all, it's sort of, it's one unit larger than the individual. So it's, it's yes. sort of, in a sense, it's a little communist society. Yes. And then what Paul does is he takes the language of the family, then he applies this to the church. And right. so he's essentially saying that he's essentially calling for this little communist society um, where private property is abolished, which is, um, I don't know if, if this is like, um, if this follows directly from... In the big book on integralism, by the way, by uh, Crayon and Finister, one, one's uh, American, one's uh, British, Dominican, uh, you know, the one that's... Uh, it, it, by the way, in that book, they actually defend slavery uh, in passing, including possibly hereditary slavery. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, no kidding. That's an important thing to do with your time, too, right? Yeah, yeah, and and uh, um, uh, but uh, wow, very, yeah, no, I mean, there's not you you cannot hold these guys in sufficient contempt. Uh, you know, even if they weren't obviously uh, heretics, they're just so stupid and evil that that a, you you deserve they deserve nothing but 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 your disdain. Uh, there's there's just a a constant current of cruelty and uh, and vicious, especially. I mean, they're not racists in the sense that they would not. That, that for them, everything is about politic is about religious belonging. So they're not anti-Semitic, in the sense that 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 uh, we're anti-Muslim in, except in religious terms, not racial terms. So you can give them that. But then again, they're also American libertarian. At least one of them is in, in, the, in the amount of. The, the, the space they devote to private property as an as a, as a good uh, you know according to natural law mm -hmm. and is proportionate to human nature, which is hilarious when you consider that Christ's every single remark on private property uh, is that it's it, it is that it is an impediment to union with God in the kingdom. You know, I don't know what you do with that, but the truth is, uh, you know, clearly Christ was not. Uh, was not was not a fellow that you would want in the American Enterprise Institute. He, mm -hmm. he would not get along with anyone there. I was I was reading um, you know, one of the I don't know I don't know if you've read any of the kind of hot right Anabaptist people, but there was one of them who was kind of talking about how he says in 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 the beginning of creation, um, uh, sort of God established that people should have all things in common, and then he says. Um, if people could just reach out and grab hold of the stars and the moon and the air and the sun, then they would do so and just accumulate that for themselves. Oh, well, so this it, is, there's you're... the idea there that even to have private property is already a kind of consequence of the fall. No, I mean and, that's that's a common that's a common trope in the church fathers. Yeah, I think in in, in wow. Basil of Caesarea and John Chrysostom, uh, I'm editing with a fellow named Trevor Logan, uh, a reader on, on uh, well, it's a Christian socialist reader, but it includes mm. pre-socialism. And, and the patristic material is, is shockingly radical. I mean, you know, you read John Chrysostom and McEwnan comes across as a moderate conservative, you know, as a, as a respectable American Republican of the old, well, back when there were respectable Republicans. 
now the Republican Party is a terrorist fascist party. <laughs> but back in the days when the you know the Eisenhower Republicans, when you had decent people in the party, still uh, that's you know. Uh, whereas you know, Chris Austin makes Peter Kropotkin you know look a little bit tepid. You know? I mean, even even the idea of of charity is kind of. It's not you, uh, sort of man. How do you say this word? Magnanimously. Um, magnanimously. Magnanimously <laughs> giving giving of your bountiful wealth to the poor. It's you. It's amazing how many of them seem to think. I mean, how many people make that argument that oh, it's all about it's all about private giving. It is. Like, it know. isn't. It's 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 like um, anything you have that isn't to sustain your need is sort of a form of theft from the food. From, That's from what Basil food. says. Yeah. Yes. Every, every coat that you own that you do not need is a coat you've stolen from the poor. Every, all the food you have that, that you are not eating, but don't, uh, and not giving to the poor is food you've ripped from the mouths of starving children. You know, they, they're uncompromising in this. I, you know, they, they really took it very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, as late as it, and it's funny. It's it's at the same period that, of course, the imperial church is coming into existence. So they're still using the language that obviously was three centuries old for Christians. You know, this ferocious language, while at the same time uh, the institutional church is becoming more and more uh, the church of the wealthy and the powerful and the empire. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a curious contradiction, and it's a curious tension that I think persists throughout Christian history never goes away uh, you know um, I don't know if you I mean okay so we talked about that I mean um, you talked earlier about the sort of context of debt slavery in the New Testament um, and in Christ's teachings I wonder could you shed some light on you know the, the sort of sexual teachings of Christ where it talks about uh, divorce or, you know, whoever gazed at a woman lustfully, like, what do you think, what are we supposed to make of that? And how can well, we make sense of that today? Like, um, it, it, the yeah. thing about gazing at a woman lustfully, that's, uh, yini, you know, woman as meaning married woman as opposed mm -hmm. to maiden. And the way it, what the Greek actually says, um, is, is to look at a woman with the intention of, to look at a wife precisely with the intention of lusting after her. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, you've already uh, committed adultery. You've already uh, willfully tried in a sense, you know, in your heart, proleptically violated the wedding covenant. Uh, it's very specific. He doesn't mean that, that every teenage boy who sees a girl in a short skirt and, 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 and his eyes go wild, uh, wide for a moment has committed adultery. He means specifically within the, you know, the marriage covenant of man and a woman, a yini, a wife, remember, uh, anir, yini, these, or, or I'm sorry, I, forgive me for using the uh, demotic pronunciation. But anyway, <laughs> these words both mean man and woman and husband and wife. There, there were no separate, these weren't, there were no separate terms. Or, so you became uh, a man and a woman in a sense, became man and woman in the marital bond. And you went from being a boy and a girl, okay. Well, or, you know, or, or a, a, a young man and, and a Thebe and a maiden, you know. Well, as for the things of divorce, you know, uh, there too, as I mean, uh, the, the, the language of divorce, the way we use it today, isn't quite reflective of what he's talking about. Under the law as it existed in his day in Judea and Galilee, if a man tired of his wife, and this was not a reciprocal power, she couldn't do this, he could write, put out a writ of separation and expel her. That's And, and the language he uses is expelling. He doesn't, he is, you know, or, or, or putting aside, getting rid of. Now, at that time, remember, a wife was much younger than her husband usually, was entirely dependent on him, the property. To expel a woman with a writ of separation was to contemn her to poverty and almost certainly to harlotry. So, so Jesus is talking quite seriously when he says, if you divorce, you know, you know, you're making her into 
a prostitute. Hmm. He means you're condemning her to that. Okay. And given the tenor of his teachings, the whole is about the injustice of, of, of the, the mistreatment of the poor and obviously the mistreatment of women uh, under these laws as well. Something he, he obviously, you know, it makes perfect sense that he would condemn this as the, the very quintessence of, of injustice, you know. Mm -hmm. How, how you then apply it to the issue of the sort of voluntary dissolution of marriages between two adults who turned it, found out they made a mistake is going to be an, a, a, an article, is going to be an object of debate till the end of time, I suppose. I mean, the Catholic Church pretends that there's a distinction between divorce and annulment, but when you actually look at the practice of annulment, 90% of the time it's just divorce under a different name. Yeah. Uh, the Orthodox allow again for consensual divorce, and if you look at the terms of it, it's the same terms that the Catholic Church would call annulment. Uh, the clearly annulment is divorce, so the notion that the Catholic Church doesn't allow divorce is simply a, a fiction that, for some reason, we continue to maintain, contrary to all the evidence. Um, but what Christ is talking about is not divorce in the modern sense. That doesn't mean it doesn't apply. I have no answers on that. I've been, as of a few days ago, I've been married for 33 years. So, you know, I figure this thing's going to last. So it's not an issue I have to confront personally. <laughs> All right. But I think others where it's clear that the marriage was a disastrous folly, an absolute misery. It wasn't the case, uh, and when it dissolved, it wasn't the case of a man unjustly kicking a young wife out so he could take a younger wife whom he preferred, or of a wife having been uh, inveigled away by a seducer, but simply the, the, the collapse of what had always been uh, a bad marriage between consenting adults. And though the, the issues may be analogous, they aren't identical. And I tend to think that the Orthodox and Catholic solutions uh, are pretty much the same under different names. And of course, Protestantism, anything goes, you know. A, I, <laughs> yeah. So that, you know, I mean, I, I think when you put when you put Christ's words historically into context, and then you compare them to things that Paul says, which <sighs> seem to suggest that he you know, thinks it's tolerable for there to be remarriage, uh, but it's not ideal. And then you look at the early Christian practices, free them from the mythology, and you see that there were not any, you know, there were, the practices weren't uniform. Uh, you know, there were penit basically rules of penitential reconciliation after a second marriage in many places. And people pretend that there's been some sort of consistent church teaching from the earliest day, and there simply wasn't. Is simply not true. I've never been attacked uh, more vigorously for saying anything than for saying that, except uh, suggesting that there's not uh, an eternal hell, which of course, as we know. What about the, the communist piece? I would have. <laughs> oh no! Well, in Amer America, <laughs> the whole the, the whole socialism thing. I mean, uh, yeah, Americans get upset. A lot of Americans do. I. I uh, I don't tend to take Americans seriously because uh, they're Americans. <laughs> Growing up among them, and I, they're, they're like the stupidest people on earth. I mean, they willfully ignorant of the whole of human history because the past is prologue. America is the only reality that matters, and so we 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 don't care about uh, uh, anything other than the sort of fantasy world that we've created, uh, you know, the, the sort of, uh, I mean, I, I see America as a kind of, as the first sketch of Disney World. I think Disney World is when the American <laughs> project was finally completed and reached the consummation uh, to which it was always aimed. But I mean, for God's sake, 74 million Americans voted for a second term for Donald Trump. I mean, for God's sake, I mean, you know, crustaceans aren't that stupid. Uh, <laughs> that, I mean, there's something deeply wrong with us as a society, something deeply amiss if you have, and I'll tell you, let's say like 60, let's guess it's 60 million of those 
voters probably far more considered themselves Christians. I mean, white evangelical culture is all in for Trump. How is that possible? I mean, you have to be, live in such a, a state of, of uh, alienation from reality and reason and love to think that, that, a Christ, that, that, that Christianity is compatible not only with the other things Americans always mix it with, like gun rights, property rights, building a wall on the southern border, or whatever the hell mm -hmm. else, but with this, this loathsome, evil, brutal terrorist of a man who, who stole children from the parents, whose every spoken word is a lie, whose every, whose every policy was a policy oriented both towards cruelty and towards despoiling the poor of what little they have for the enrichment of billionaires. To think that this thing uh, is, 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 could possibly be an object of the loyalty of baptized Christians requires such a deep, such a profound lunacy or stupidity or whatever it is that America uniquely seems capable of breeding in her in children. Uh, it, it, it just beggars the imagination. Yeah, it, it was it, it was striking to me that, um, you know, there was all this talk of um, this sort of desperation that this that is motivated by this and, you know, how how sort of bad our society is and so on. And, the, and then the response is to sort of get the man with the biggest stick to like, that's what's the desperation. Of, I mean, let, let's be honest. Sure. You can say, well, there's been a, a, a constant decline of the standard of living for the working and middle class. That's true. As a result, principally of Republican policy, but also of Democrat policy. I don't think that's that's the mo I mean, maybe that's I don't think that's what motivated the Christian voters. I think the Christian voters are probably motivated by a sense of the loss of Christendom or something like that. Right. Well, but that's the other thing is, is that what they mean is. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, to be honest, I think a lot of people voted for Trump because they were angry about having had a black president. Don't don't overlook that aspect. Even those who think they aren't racist, there were many who were. Then there are those who aren't. Who you're right, think that Christian America is going away. But exactly, what is Christian America? You have to start from the premises. What it is they think they're losing. Do they think that uh, a culture devoted to the principles of the Sermon on the Mount? Is, is disappearing because that's certainly not, not what they mean. What, what, what they mean is, is seriously, I mean, like the Second Amendment uh, is almost as sacred as the Sermon on the Mount for them. Yeah. Uh, they mean, uh, you know, you know, all right, they get in, they, they say gay marriage, but at the same time, they're willing to abide with systems of of ownership of debt of credit which destroy communities and enslave the poor they can live with all sorts of social evils that are the ones that are the principal concern of christ in the gospels mm -hmm. But the more symbolic thing now, I, I, all right, we'll put abortion to one side. That's a different issue. That's an old issue in, in America. And it's true that, that Roe versus Wade was handed down from on high. And it's not, you know, it's obviously bad law. I mean, it, it's, it doesn't, I mean, the, the, the constitutional principles obviously weren't there. So that was the beginning, in a sense, of the alienation of certain Christians from progress, supposedly progressive politics. I understand that. There's a history there. Uh, but to be honest, uh, what it is that they're fighting for, uh, what it is they think that the Christianity is that that Donald Trump could possibly represent the solution. There, there, there is no sense of the common good there. I mean, uh, it's, I mean it's, the the most, it's, it's the most destructive vote you could think of. It's, it's, if you look at the carnage after four years of, of that president in the United States, yeah. The polarization, the burning cities, the racial tensions. I mean, how could you possibly think that was the sheer a vote for the good of the country? The sheer incompetence of dealing with the uh, with the COVID nineteen crisis. Um, yeah, and you know, just and and our border policy was based on cruelty. It was the cruelty was the point. 
I mean, it was barbaric, the human rights abuses for which he and his administration should be in prison even now or before The Hague uh, were atrocities. People said, well, you know, who was there in place of the Obama, you know, you know there was a, you know, a, 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 there was no zero tolerance policy under Obama and Obama did deport lots of people and that was rather miserable behavior on his part too, but it was nothing compared to, to uh, willfully separating children from their parents uh, in perpetuity uh, and treating asylum seekers as criminals and using every possible means not only to harm but to humiliate uh, and to stigmatize people who are after all only seeking shelter from from poverty and violence. Mm -hmm. um, how much time do we have? I have a, I have a, a few more uh, questions if, if you have time. I have, well, I have a little bit. Okay. okay. Um, have... Sorry. Yeah, um, I'm wondering, uh, or gee, there's a few, three, I add at least three big ones. Um, sorry to, to sort of drag it down these rabbit holes, but like, um, I wonder, have you, do you have any sort of advice on the kind of vex issue around same sex um, marriage and so on? I mean, um, for example, what do you make of uh, sort of Rowan Williams' argument in, in The Body's Grace? Um, is that something you find compelling or um, certainly as to me? Um, oh, gosh, but, um, it's, it's been so many years since I read that. Um, I've never heard you say that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, well, I but, mean, even I, because that was one essay, right? I, I, mm -hmm. I generally think Rowan is a wise man. I, I don't, just don't remember where he was on the issue at that time. Um, I, I, I think Christians uh, shouldn't shouldn't worry about. I mean, as long as they're not being coerced to violate their own consciences, just to give it a rest, uh, you know. Um, and uh, uh, I, you know, if if, if uh, you really, first of all, I mean, I, I don't know why Americans, especially, think that a, that that a constituted political order, which began specifically as being a non-established, having no church establishment, is under any obligation mm -hmm. uh, to take seriously their concerns in this regard. But the truth is. They're not going to have success. Uh, so, if that's the, for them the biggest issue, I, I would advise them to go live on another planet, because <laughs> it's, it, it, th this issue is done for. I mean, it's over. I mean, this, you know, you, you talk to young, young people, young Christians, and they'll tell you, you know, for, for them, this isn't a matter of personal preference. For them, the idea of going back on this issue would be like people of our generation having second thought of my generation, not yours. What are you, six? The people of my generation <laughs> having second thoughts about the civil rights movement. It's, yeah. I mean, it's that fundamental for them. Absolutely. And frankly, I'm not, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I, I just, I don't think that this is an issue of any concern at all for me. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so much more that's uh, of greater importance, and I'm not going to, uh, you know, worry about what, what, what you know, it, it, you're talking about civil marriages, unless they start marching into churches and forcing people against their conscience to have sacramental wedding marriages that are contrary to their teachings, then that's not, you know, unless they're doing that, then I would just advise Christians to live with the reality, the traditionalist Christians, that they're not going to change. And that, after all, is not actually anywhere near so grave an issue as, say, poverty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, um, or even the issue of violence. I mean, um, yeah. this is sort of another central teaching in... Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I find it... Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. I find... I find it curious. I've known, again, Christians for whom the Obergefell decision was, was the breaking point. But why was that the breaking point? I mean, I, 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 you know, uh, 
why not the John Roberts court stripping away the voting rights bill? Why wasn't that a breaking point? You know, why, why is it always the social issues that have to do specifically with the things that concern principally uh, a, a certain sort of idealized view of society according to a certain set of middle-class expectations, what it is to live. I mean, David, could I, could I just add something here? I mean, what the interesting pattern is, we were talking earlier about these sort of, sort of three fundamental, you know, the, the society, the family, and so on, that, that are fundamentally challenged by, by Christ's teachings. I mean, I think you, I could maybe tack on to what you're saying, that maybe it's interesting that it's these areas that are sort of the fundamental things that, that conservative Christians feel like they need to defend, sort of, you know, the yeah. family or the economic order or the... Yeah, no. I, yeah I, I, I just find I, that... I just, don't, I, just, I just don't think that, that, that that's actually... The Christian life is about creating a certain sort of political social order that 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 upholds these sorts of you know, certain sorts of standards or I just don't I mean I, I really do think it was a you know from Christ, the time of Christ and the apostles much more of a kind of radical radically subsidiarist perhaps but also kind of anarcho-communist movement I just you know I <laughs> I don't know what to you know I don't know what else I again I don't even know what the practical application is half the time I'm not trying yeah. to sit here as a savant it's just that it amazes me what things people are willing to go to the barricades for. And it never seems to be the things that are most conspicuously prominent in the teachings of Christ. Um, okay, here's a, I guess this, this ties it back to our earlier discussion about natural law. But um, let me read a passage um, from your article. I think this is from um, Christ's Rabble. Um, so you said, most of us would, would find Christians truly cast in the New Testament mold, fairly obnoxious, civilly retrobate, ideologically unsound, economically destructive, politically irresponsible, socially discredible, and really just a bit indecent. Um, and I think that's, that's fundamentally right. But um, I guess I, I just wonder about um, right, reading the New Testament and thinking about this concept of human flourishing, like how how do you how do you think about the the connection there um i'm reminded yeah. of um yeah. could i just sorry um you know charles taylor for example in his book um a secular age he talks about this sort of fundamental tension between human flourishing and what he calls um beyond human flourishing and he says there's this sort of um tension even with, within christianity and also within buddhism between these sort of sort of higher demands, maybe these eschatological dimensions, and then the sort of ordinary demands of life. Um, but but we, we don't talk about human flourishing in terms of ordinary demands of human life, do we? I mean, at least not in America. We talk about human flourishing in terms of getting wealthy. Mm -hmm. Assuming that the wealthier you are, the more you're flourishing. You're flourishing. Uh, that's already a, a sort of perverse notion that the human flour, you know, I've, I've this argument with people is that, well, you know, you, you stick with free market capitalism because it creates wealth. Now, this is, of course, a rather rosy view of things anyway, because the wealth it creates is not, does not trickle down nearly as, in, in as in nearly as full a cascade as uh, people like to pretend. And the amount of damage done to civil society, to the environment, uh, uh, to the, the life we live in common is is horrendous. I mean, look at, I, I'm from Maryland, and in the summers, we would often go west, through western Maryland to West Virginia, because we love the mountains, and, you know, take family vacations deep in them. So I know a lot about West Virginia, for instance, uh, or and eastern Kentucky and places like that. And you look at one of the, you know, the, the sheer damage done there. I mean, how much, how, what a poor state it is. It's a state where capital investment, you could argue, went on a rampage. 
when the uh, you know mineral rights uh, sales to the oil to the coal companies, people who used to be ha have land and lived in a certain kind of community have grand had grandchildren and great grandchildren who work in mines and and uh, live in a in a constantly deteriorating environment. The wealth that that West Virginia has generated has done a lot for shareholders of certain co corporations, but nothing f for the people whose labor value is actually translated into that wealth, but it has destroyed the, the place they live. And then, of course, they have an, in because that's the only source of income for them now, you know, they'll fight They'll fight for the coal industry, even though you know it's it it is. You know where's the human flourishing there? Well, for an American, you you know quite often that means well you know, capitalism has created wealth, for, and so these people they 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 have high definition televisions. So if you say, so you know, human if you start with say well you know. What Christianity and Buddhism demand in the ultimate sense is intention with with good. Well, how do we know that? Have we ever actually had a society that put aside the assumption that just the maximum, especially in the modern world, the maximum accumulation of material wealth is what it is to flourish? And I thought maybe it's possible to flourish in a more communitarian or a more uh, in a way that also would not be devoid of material production. I mean, you know, maybe. Peter Kropotkin was right, if you've ever read Mutual Aid, uh, is give it a chance, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, you might find that actually there's no more practical way to cultivate a true human flourishing in a community of love and knowledge and mutual aid than, than the sort of ethos uh, that Christianity or Buddhism or uh, other traditions uh, treat as an ultimate good because well, they, all, if you look at them have profound social consequences it's just a matter of whether or not you have the society willing to pursue those goods with enough fidelity actually to produce the consequences that might naturally flow from them i i guess maybe the the, the way in which it is um intention with human flourishing is is sort of in the present order um you know maybe well, that's that's where the the, the concept of the holy be, fool or the martyr comes from right it's, i mean uh, let me ask you is you know let's let's take the most uh detestable example available to us right now donald trump <laughs> As money, as fame, he was president of the United States. He was at least putatively the most powerful man in the world. And if he hadn't been stupider than a crayfish, he actually would have been uh, as powerful as he thought he was. <laughs> Is he a person who's flourishing? I mean, I, I've never seen a more desiccated <laughs> uh, remnant of a human soul waddling around than I see when I see him. Uh, I mean, that's you talk about being in a state of hell, and where does the hell come from? Is the pursuit of wealth, pursuit of power, pursuit of prestige, pursuit of women to grab? You know, I, I so. that article you wrote, um, about was it the devil in Donald's likeness or something? I didn't know you were a prophet, uh, David. Yeah, yeah I just, God, that was what, what year I don't remember, that was like 2011, wasn't it? Yeah. So, <laughs> I, I, I uh, owe my prophetic soul. I, I, uh, I, I, but even then, you could tell there was something uh, about the, the. I guess it, it occurred to me that he had political ambitions. Then mostly, mm. I thought they, he was attempting to uh, increase his his brand. You know, to benefit his brand, which I think is really what he was trying to do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> get shocked, shocked the hell out of him when he actually got elected. Um, but I mean, you know, I, 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 you know, I, 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 I just, uh, I think the whole f question of, of, of human flourishing is sort of an empty question as long as we assume 
that 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 means what the present order of values tells us it means mm -hmm. because right. then it's tautology it's like well what's good for people that they all have high definition televisions well there are other measures of the good that i would think are, are more important but during baseball season I'm, I'm grateful for high definition tv so i can't pretend to be a saint in this regard fair enough um this takes us in a bit of a different direction but I was recently at a funeral. Um, this is a, this is a pretty. I, I, there, there's no other word to describe the situation. The tragic, like um, there was this young couple um, married for three months, and then the husband just tragically died. I think he just passed away on a on a, on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, so and then the at the wake, the the pastor stands up, and then he says, um, "You know, I have a hard time calling this a tragedy." And he doesn't, he doesn't mean that because he didn't mean that because he had a sense that this guy is going to be in heaven. He's in a better place. He, he was talking about his trust in the providential will of God being expressed in this situation. Um, and I've, I've had, you know, it's, it's been a pretty awful year for me and, um, and for many of us, I would guess. And get in line. <laughs> get in line. Yeah. It's, it's, it's been pretty yeah, awful, but stop whining at me. Yeah, no, sorry. Go on. Just we could we could um we could have a competition to see his had a worse when i think i'd come out on top but um <laughs> um but maybe let's not yeah let's not <laughs> um, but anyway could could you could you talk about why why that is a sub-christian way of uh, well, talking I mean, about this that, i mean that you've just opened up an entirely different line of you know, theodicy and all that I mean, it's connected in a sense isn't it it is. Um, I mean, clearly, that's not the New Testament view of things, is it? I mean, you know, that's sort of serene, reformed era, providentialism, all things are dis uh, God's disposition. The very 16th century way of thinking. It's not what you find in the New Testament where there really is uh, a world in the grip of death that does not live by the laws of God, but, un but lives rather by by the power, it lies in the power of the evil one. And he puts it, you know, there is definitely a kind of dualism in the New Testament that, that many now would say is a Gnostic, you know, if they heard of it from some other source. Uh, you know, it's not an ultimate ontological dualism. There's only one God, but nonetheless, uh, the way the New Testament approaches it is that there, you know, we do live tragically. We live uh, in a cosmic dispensation that's out of order with its eternal nature and its eternal destiny, that it is under powers and and pr lies under the, the influence of principles that are actually contrary to what, what a loving God would will or does well for it. And so people who, when you hear a young husband, you know, just, uh, you know, leaving behind a, a, a young woman who, who married him and loved him, obviously, and was going to build a, wi a life with him. And, and the, through some insidious principle of some sort of sublime providentialism that would even make the Stoics uh, blush and its simple mindedness, thinking that this isn't tragic, this isn't a horror, this isn't something contrary to the good and to the will of, of uh, to the, you know, divine love. Uh, is is it, it's it's not only a little bit inhuman. It's, it's simply not Christian. It's not what if you take the New Testament as indicative of what Christianity is. I hear it has some authority uh, in the tradition. So, yeah, it. Um, I think we're down to one question left. Oh, so, one question. Ah, boy, I have to. I, I'm almost out of voice here. I could actually. I could. Yeah, I I could kind of hear it, sort of. Uh, <laughs> we've had, we've had. Well, I have damaged lungs anyway, so I, I uh, have to be careful of not talking too much because then I have to go on a nebulizer. But it's, it's here. It's also uh, getting a lot of pollen. And, yeah, uh, I I, um, I read about that in um, Roland. Uh, you, you talked about how how you contracted that that. Um, oh, that's right. Yes. That how far like have, you, a... have you finished that book yet? I'm, I'm, I'm slowly working my way through it. It's, it's kind of, um, so much of it is sort of, um, 
I don't know. <laughs> are, you, are you enjoying it is the question. Um, yes, I am enjoying it. Um, though sometimes it, it sort of uh, flies past my head a bit, I'm afraid. But yeah, it's... Well, dogs, you know, very deep. <laughs> He's much smarter than I am. Yeah. <laughs> the dog. Oh, well, we all feel that way around Roland. <laughs> yeah. The dog. Oh, um, yeah. Um, I, I don't know where to go with this. Um, yeah, I mean, um, you were talking about, about sort of the Gnostic uh, vision here. Um, and it, that's been something I've noticed popping up more and more in, in your recent talks or discussions. Um, <laughs> I have a novel coming out. I mean, a, a sort of like a fantasy novel that I used to write my way out of depression when I was very ill, which is all based on a Gnostic hymn. So, I, oh. The issue of Gnosticism is going to recur uh, for me for a while. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess the, the question I have there is, um, how do you think about um, creation or nature um, as something good yet fallen at the same time um, under you know, have you, I, I enjoyed, I found the language you used earlier interesting where you said that creation still has this sort of teleological um, uh, pull towards something that it's under these fallen powers. Right. Um, and, and you have this, this wonderful passage here in Roland, if, if you'd like me to read it, I could. Um, I, I, I'd, I'd certainly like to hear it with your accent. <laughs> oh, let me see. Um, where do I have it here? I have it. I have one of my blue sticky notes here. Um, Good. As, as long as it's not one of the orange ones. You know, you know how I feel. <laughs> but I just love this one. I, I mean, I, I can I can resonate with this one. You say, on the one hand, this is Roland describing you, and he says, on the one hand, you're an aesthete, a step, aesthete, acutely devoted to the beauty of this world, almost to the point of hedonism. On the other hand, you suffer from an almost morbid obsession with the suffering and death and the suffering and death of the innocent of children and enemies in particular for you this world is sometimes a radiant symbol of a higher world a symbol caught for a time in the shadowy trammels of mor mortality and delusion and sin but shining brightly amid the darkness even so at, at other times however it's simply a sporadically lovely mask dissembling an absolute abyss of elemental violence and idiot, and idiot faith Sometimes you see it as the glorious prelude to something unambiguous, unimaginably good, and sometimes as something absolutely alien to the true good from which we've all been exiled. You love nature, love creation, but something in you also hates the world. Yeah, I... See, as the thing about Roland is he knows how to put things, I think, with extraordinary clarity. I, I, I've always been in awe of his abilities. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's true, though, isn't it? I mean, uh, absolutely, it's not just true of me. Um, I think that we we need to rethink. I mean, the thing is, of course, that I, I think when you come to the issue of Gnosticism, I mean, there were these schools like the Sethians, especially who engaged in this kind of mythopoetic incontinence, that, you know, uh, and and the dualism that becomes incredible in its own terms, so which a meta myth rather than metaphysics going astray. But in the condemnation of the Gnostic impulse, a lot of things that are present in the New Testament have tended to get, uh, I can put it, uh, politely edited out of the record as though they aren't part of the original gospel as well. Mm -hmm. Part of those is just translation practices, you know, I think it's always a shock when I used to teach undergraduates the Greek New Testament, who, I mean, when they had enough Greek for it. Uh, those who are familiar with Gnostic trans, translations of Gnostic materials were used to, in those translations, encountering words like archons or the pneumatics as opposed to the uh, the psychics or, you know, the, or uh, you know, all these. But when they had read it, 
in the Bible, of course, they, there were these old translations in which archons are rulers, you know. And so they were literally, at, at just the most basic semantic level, unaware of what they thought of as the distinctive, wildly, uh, elaborately, exotically mythological language of Gnosticism is actually just the terminology of the New Testament. And that a lot of the claims made uh, in the New Testament, especially in the Gospel of John and in the teachings of Paul, uh, are, you know, really, you know, now, if you were just to come at most Christians and repeat those teachings in a slightly different language so they didn't recognize the scriptural sources, and they had some notion of Gnosticism in their mind, they would say, well, that's some, you know, Gnostic teaching. Um, and part of this was, of course, also that the first great age of scholarship into Gnosticism uh, as, as an area of, of uh, textual research, but also church historical research, well before the discovery of Nakamani, it was, you know, Bauer and Neander, and they tended to assimilate it to aspects of German idealism. And in doing so, more or less totally reversed the actual logic of these schools. I mean, they, they, they you know, the German idealism is not a dualist tradition. It's anything but. Whereas these were severely dualist. What they did is they took the sort of provisional dualism that's clearly there in the New Testament and arguably exaggerated it, but, but not always, it wasn't always an exaggeration. I mean, you know, uh, so, uh, our understanding of, of, of that period has to be recovered because it's the only way we're going to get back to a proper understanding of what's actually in the New Testament. It's not, quite often, it's not what most people think is there, you know. And uh, the, the picture in the New Testament is a lot more dualistic. And you see this maintained through the high patristic period. There is a sense in which you could argue that, say, for Maximus the Confessor, creation hasn't really happened yet, or for Gregory mm. of Nyssa, because the true creation is that eternal reality that God wills in the beginning, and that allegorically, or not allegorically, but exegetically, they read as the first creation account of Genesis 1. Whereas the creation we live in, you know, which is like the Genesis 2 account, is, is not yet that. Hmm. And until it is that, uh, creation has not yet occurred. We still live in a shadow of the real. We, we live among shadows. And this is very much part of the sensibility of Paul. I mean, when he talks about seeing things in a mirror, in an enigma, you know, through a glass darkly. Uh, there is at once uh, a theology of creation there, the creation that is yet to be revealed, the thing that all of, na all, all of creation longs for and groans for is a birth pains, but that has never yet come to pass. And it's united to a clearly platonic language of the radiance of the real over against the obscurity of the here below, of the world of shadows. And uh, that's very much the world of the New the intellectual, spiritual world of the New Testament and the early church. And uh, so, I, I mean, I'm going to be writing a lot more about Gnosticism in the future, but I, but I, mostly because I'm trying to recover mm -hmm. uh, very early Christianity from uh, the accidental. Uh, misapprehensions created by a certain understanding of what we think was Gnosticism. Can we uh, bring it to a close there? I'm, I'm not going to have any voice left. Yeah, that was just something going over the public address. Um, yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. This is a good place to end. Um, Thank you so much for your time. Um, this was, really enjoyed this. Well, thanks for inviting me. I'm sure that some of the more incendiary things I said will lose me uh, some sympathy some places, so. <laughs> it's not that you more, weren't more incendiary than you've been in other places, so. This I is think, true, this yeah. is true. <laughs>
But now that I have a Substack a newsletter, I want everyone to want to subscribe because. Yes, um, David does have a Substack, and he has um, a whole heap of new books coming out. So everyone should go buy those at places other than other than Amazon. Um, though he is a um, money lover at heart, I think. That's right. Uh, purely mercenary. <laughs> Well, I do believe that uh, that one does have to eat to live. So I, I do want to be able to, you know, to keep providing. So yes, well, uh, no objection to a fair exchange. You know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, uh, it's good to meet. Good to talk. Yeah, this was fun. Um, I mean, you you were you were you were so helpful for helping me think through a lot of the, the, the kinds of things I've been thinking about. Um, I've been particularly trying to think through how to think about, uh, you might've noticed this theme in the conversation, but sort of the, the radical core of the New Testament and how that intersects with, um, you know, something like natural law or uh, even natural theology. Um, yeah. And um, you seem to somehow integrate both of those in your work. Like you talk about, um, uh, you know, you're not, you're no Bartonian in that sense, but um, uh, no. I don't know, but yeah. I, I, I don't, this stuff is I, beyond I, me. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Yes, thank you. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>